Hey everybody. Uh, you'll notice I'm wearing a different hat here. I've had some people ask me about the hats that are usually in the background of my videos. Um, this is one of them. Um, I, I don't wear this hat a lot. If I'm going to be outdoors for a long period of time, uh, I want to protect the back of my neck and my ears from sun, then I'll, this is the hat I'll put on if I'm doing some yard work or doing some other activities outside on a bright sunny day. Uh, this hat is older than most of you are. I purchased this hat in, I want to say about 1990, maybe 89. Now, it, it would have been 90 or 91 probably when I purchased this hat. I've had it for a long time, and it's starting to show its age. But for me, a good hat, you know, a hat's a tool that should be worn, it should be used, and it, you know, if you wear it the way it's supposed to be worn, it's going to show its age over time. It's, it'll last me for the rest of my life, assuming that my head doesn't get any larger or the hat doesn't shrink up. And hats do shrink up. I always keep them on a, on a hat stretcher. I've got a couple of different hats. Uh, this other hat, go ahead and show you this one. I know you just love this information. It won't be on the test. Uh, this is the other. I probably wear this hat more often. It's more of a winter hat when it's cold and rainy. And it's a tool. I don't wear it as a fashion statement. I wear it to keep the rain off my, off of me and to keep the uh, keep my head warm. So that's it on the hats. I've got some others that I that I wear also. Uh, but those are my two favorite hats. Uh, I've got another hat. It was my grandfather's old hat. It's about 70 years old. I'd like to get it rebuilt one of these days. It doesn't fit. It's shrunk up over time. It hasn't had a hat stretcher in it for many, many, many years, and it's shrunk up, and it won't even, it's not even close to fitting my head. So, All right, enough of that. Wasted enough of your time. But I, there were questions about the hats. That's why I, I shared a few minutes with you talking about the hats. Uh, in this video tutorial, we want to talk about crane capacity. Uh, a crane's capacity can be found in a document called a load chart. Some of these load charts can be 30, 40, 50 pages long. Uh, the charts that we're going to look at are only 20 pages long. They are modified load charts that are used for the CCO crane operator certification exams. That's what I'm going to use to, to illustrate uh, what a low chart's all about and how to use the low charts. The capacities that we see in these low charts have been determined by design engineers and they're based upon two very general variables. The amount of weight that can cause a crane to tip over is one of the variables or tipping weight. The other variable is the amount of weight that can cause a structural failure in the crane or the structural capacity of the crane. Now the, the tipping capacities, if we look at a chart, and this is any chart, this is, this is a regulated requirement here. The capacity found in the low chart are 75% of tipping for lattice boom cranes. Uh, for telescopic boom cranes, the, the chart numbers that we see, the chart capacities we see, are limited to 85% of the load that would cause the crane to tip. So there is a safety factor built into the charts. Um, now the tipping factor has nothing to do with the structural capacity of the crane. Uh, a crane's low chart, and I'll show you this when we start looking at the Manitowoc lattice boom crawler low chart. Um, the crane's chart will be divided into structural capacity limits and tipping capacity limits. Again, more on that as we, uh, as we go along in this unit. A crane's capacity for our purposes can be thought of as a function of the boom length of the crane and the radius of the crane or the boom angle of the crane. And I know that's foreign to you. You don't know what the heck I mean by radius or boom angle. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, for now, as radius increases, a crane loses capacity, or the load moment increases. We've talked about load moment. We've talked about how a crane works, how it's like a balance, and we're trying to keep it balanced between the, the uh, crane's leverage and the load's leverage. As radius increases, 
that increases the load's leverage and the crane loses capacity. As boom length increases, the crane also loses capacity. The load moment increases or the load, uh, the load leverage is increased. As boom angle decreases, the crane loses capacity. As you lower the boom, as the angle between the ground and the boom decreases, the crane loses capacity, also causing the crane to lose leverage and the load side of the balance of the tipping axis gains leverage. All right, but let's talk a little bit more. Let me show you on a diagram what we mean by these different variables. Again, boom length is the length of the boom from the boom base to the boom tip, illustrated here in blue. The boom angle is the angle of the boom to an imaginary horizontal line. Well, I've got that color coded in green here. We have the radius arc, and then we have the horizontal dashed line here. That's what we mean by boom angle. Then finally, the radius is the horizontal distance from the crane's axis of rotation to the load's center of gravity. The further this load center of gravity is away from this axis of rotation, the less capacity the crane is going to have. And by axis of rotation, we're talking about a rotating uh, upper works, a crane with an upper works or a cab that can rotate 360 degrees. Again, most, uh, mostly 360 degrees. There are a few cranes out there that can't rotate a full 360 degrees. But for our purposes, we'll think about cranes that can rotate a full 360 degrees around this axis of rotation. And the position of this axis rotation will vary from one model of crane to the next. Also, and we've talked about this already, the center of gravity of the crane plays a role as well as far as uh, the, the tipping capacity of the crane. But as far as reading the load chart, boom length, angle, and radius. And a lot of times you'll have the, the angle and not have the radius, or maybe you have the radius and not the angle. They can be used pretty much interchangeably when we're reading a load chart. If we have the, the radius that we're working at, we'll use that to determine our load capacity, the crane's capacity. If we don't have the radius but we have the angle, we'll use the angle to determine our capacity. And as I've already said, the boom angle and the radius can be used interchangeably. Another point that I want to mention here, we've talked about load moment indicators and some of the, the newer technology that can be used to determine what the uh, load capacity of the crane is and what the weight of the load is. The LMIs or the load moment indicators that we've talked about, they are great. They are very useful. They make crane operating a lot safer. Uh, undertaking than it used to be 40, 50 years ago. But when you are getting close to the maximum capacity of the crane, you can't just depend on the computer. Again, this is regulatory. You've got to use the paper charts and you've got to physically determine the load moment that's being generated and the load capacity of the crane to ensure that uh, everything is going to be safe in the crane operation and the lifting operation. The reason there's this requirement is because computers can be out of calibration. Computers can make mistakes. When you get close to the maximum, you gotta say, oh, computer's great, but we need to double check this. We need to get out the pencil and paper and look at the load charts and determine for sure that we are safe to make the lift. All right, the load chart we're going to look at is the Manitowoc load chart for one of Manitowoc's lattice boom crawlers. The actual crane model that we're working with here is the Manitowoc 888. Uh, now this is a modified load chart that is designed for use on the CCO specialty exams. It's not a complete load chart. It's only about 20 pages long. Uh, these charts that are designed for the exam, although they're accurate, they should not be used for actual lifting. 
uh, uh, actual lift planning. Again, 20 pages of information includes the load chart notes, which we'll talk about, the main boom charts, and a chart for the 30-foot jib and a chart for the 40-foot jib. Again, not intended for actual field use. Okay, these are, this is what we mean by load chart notes. Uh, these are some manufacturer guidelines the operator must follow to make safe li lifts. If a operator violates any of these guidelines, even though we're calling them guidelines, if the operator violates any of them and there's an accident, it's all on the operator, it's all on the company. And it can be used by OSHA as the basis for writing a citation to the company. These guidelines are like laws when it comes to, to OSHA and from OSHA's perspective. Uh, some of the important notes for the Manitowoc. A single part line. If you're using a single hoist line to lift a load, the maximum capacity is 29,500 pounds. Each line, if you have multiple parts line, Let's say you have four parts line. Your capacity is going to be four times 29,500. This also tells you what deductions must be taken from the crane's capacity. We haven't got there yet to talk about this, but when you're planning a lift, you've got to deduct any devices that are hanging below the, the boom tip. And more on that. Uh, as we move along in this unit. There will also be information about various machine limitations that are identified in the load chart notes. For example, here's one here. Uh, load block hook and weight ball on the ground at the start uh, when you're lifting the boom. When you're lifting the boom, you want all these, these accessories on the ground so you would be able to, to lift up the boom. If you've got all this weight hanging from the boom, then the crane may not be able to safely lift the boom if the boom is very long. Um, the upper boom point cannot be used on a 290-foot boom. The upper boom point is like a rooster shiv. It's an auxiliary boom point. That boom point cannot be installed on 290-foot of boom, and it cannot be lifted over the rear of blocked crawlers on 280-foot of boom or uh, over the side of extended crawlers on 260 foot of boom. So yeah, I know you don't know what a lot of that means, but those are the types of restrictions that crane operators need to be aware of and they need to follow those restrictions. So what they're pointing out here in these restrictions and these low chart notes are some dangerous situations that if you go beyond these restrictions, you're at risk of having an accident, either a tip or a structural failure. It also gives you the deduction weight for the jibs. If you're using a jib off of the main boom and you're not using that jib for lifting, these weights have to be deducted depending upon the length of the jib. There are also notes that other notes that apply to when you're using the jib. Uh, the jib cannot be used with the crawlers retracted. There is no chart for the jib and crawlers retracted. That's how we know that you can't use the jib with retracted crawlers. Uh, this is a notation that's found at the top of each page of the jib charts. And there, there's more information as well. I don't want to give you information overload and have you completely lost uh, as we're working with these load charts. So let's go ahead and take a look at a main boom chart. Within that 20 page document, you're gonna find a separate chart for each main boom length, starting at 70 feet all the way out to 290 feet. You can put 290 feet or almost the length of a football field of boom on this particular crane. And for each of those boom lengths, there's going to be a separate chart. This is the boom length or this is the chart for a 90 foot boom length. If you have 90 feet of boom configured, assembled and put together on the crane, this is the chart that you would use. Uh, the chart also includes the operating radius 
Again, remember operating radius is the distance from the, the axis, the turntable axis, or the center of rotation of the, of the crane, of the upper works, out to the center of gravity of the load that we're lifting. And in this particular chart, the 90-foot boom, it can go from 19 feet all the way out to 90 feet. The main boom chart also includes the boom angle. Again, that's the angle of the boom relative to this imaginary horizontal line. The boom angles can range from 82 and a half degrees down to 20.7 degrees. Then we have boom point elevation in feet. They have elevation abbreviated, but that's boom point elevation in feet. This is the tip height of the boom at different configurations. Or by tip height, we're talking about the distance between the tip of the boom and the ground, and the surface that we're making the lift off of, the surface that the crane is sitting on. Then we have two columns for capacities. We have the boom capacity or the crane capacity off the main boom when the crawler tracks are retracted or sucked in. Then you have the capacity if the crawlers are extended. And this is a model of crane where the crawler width can be adjusted. It's either all the way out or all the way in. There aren't any midpoints. Uh, either you have them extended all the way out, which is your stronger position that's going to give you greater capacity, or you have them sucked all the way in. And again, sucked in or retracted, you don't have as much capacity with the crane. And there are some other situations that were identified in the notes where you can't make the lift with crawlers retracted. You can't use a jib if your crawlers are retracted. Everything's got to be done off the main boom if the crawlers are retracted. If you see an asterisk in the chart, that means that the capacity is based upon the structural strength of the crane or the structural integrity of the crane. Um, for this particular chart, if we're at 90 feet of boom, 32 foot radius, our capacity is 218,400 pounds. If we exceed that 218,400 pounds at this configuration, something could break on the crane. We could have a structural failure if this number is exceeded. The other values that don't have the asterisk, those are based upon tipping. If we go down to the next, next row here, 34 foot radius, 90 foot of boom, we have a 200,100 pound capacity. If we exceed this 200,000 pound capacity at this configuration, the crane will tip. That's the tipping point. Here is the 30 foot jib chart. We're gonna look at the 30 foot jib chart and the 40 foot jib chart. The 30 foot jib chart is really like three charts in one. Um, first part of the chart I want to talk about is the boom length and feet. This is the length of the main boom that the jib is attached to. For each main boom length, there's going to be a separate chart for the 30-foot jib. We also have the operating radius, and they have the operating radius in two locations in the chart, uh, the columns outlined in blue. Then we have the offset of the jib. The offset refers to the angle of the jib to the angle of the main boom. And this is where I, I get into, I mentioned earlier, this is like three, three different charts in one. There's a separate chart for each offset. There's a chart or a subchart for five degrees, a subchart for 15 degrees, and a subchart for a 25 degree offset. Then for in each of those subcharts, there is a column for boom angle. There's a column for jib point elevation or the height of the tip of the jib from the ground, above the ground. Then there's the jib capacity. 
And some of these capacities are structural capacities, and some of the capacities are based on tipping. Here's the 40-foot jib. Now, the 40-foot jib and the charts that we're using and the charts that are used on the CCO exam, it can only be attached uh, on 90 feet, 100 feet, 110 feet, and 120 feet of main boom. There's only four of these charts like this for the 40-foot jib. And it's pretty much the same. We got boom length. Again, this is the length of the main boom. We got operating radius. We've got offset. 5 degree, 15 degree, or 25 degree. Then for each of those offsets, we have boom angle, jib point elevation, and jib capacity. And notice the 40-foot jib. When you're using the 40-foot jib, if you exceed any of these numbers, these are all asterisked. These are all structural capacities. If you try to lift 31,902 pounds, at a 120-foot uh, radius with the 40-foot jib on 90 feet of main boom, there's a chance, good chance, that you're going to have a structural failure. All right, that's an overview of the charts. Let's talk about using the charts to actually find a capacity. And if you're lost, uh, hopefully, as we move on here and we do these examples, you'll get a, it'll, it'll become more clear to you. Again, it's not as easy as looking at the ID plate on a forklift, but it is, it's, it, it's doable. You guys can figure this out. First, the first challenge is to make sure you are using the correct chart. Again, you've got 20 pages of chart. You've got a chart for 130 foot of main boom. You've got a, the jib charts. Make sure you are on the correct chart, whether it's the main boom or the jib charts. Make sure it's the one that you need. That's a mistake that I see a lot of operators make on these exams. They, they get in a hurry. They, they are timed exams. They got to rush through and they, they should be on the 130 foot boom chart, but they're on the, 100, the 140 foot boom chart or they're on the 230 foot boom chart. Again, there's a lot of different charts that can be confusing. Once you make sure you, you're on the right chart, then you need to make sure you're using the correct column. Uh, again, there's, there's boom capacity with retracted crawlers. There's boom capacity with extended crawlers. That's another common mistake that operators can make. But here's an example. What is the chart capacity for 130 feet of boom at a 115 foot radius and the crawlers are extended? So the first thing we need to do is make sure we have the 130 foot chart. We're good. This is the 130 foot chart. Then we need to find the column for crawlers extended. Find this column. Make sure we're in that column. Now we need to find the row for 115 feet of radius, the capacity of the crane in this configuration is going to be where the column for extended crawlers intersects with the row for 115 foot radius. Our capacity is 33,500 pounds. That's at, again, our capacity with 130 feet of main boom at a 115 foot radius is 33,500 pounds when the crawlers are extended. Now, if we had used the wrong column, we weren't paying attention, and we were looking at the crawlers retracted uh, column instead of the crawler's extended column, where we're going to be off by about 5,000 pounds as far as our capacity. And in the real world, that could, that could result in an accident. That simple mistake of looking at the wrong column could cause an accident. Here's another example. What is the chart capacity for 170 feet of main boom at an 85 foot radius? crawlers extended. 170 feet of main boom, crawlers extended, find the right column. Now find 85 foot of radius and there's our capacity, 52,500 pounds is our capacity with 170 feet of main boom and an 80 foot, 85 foot radius. 
Now here's another one. Let's I, I don't have all the uh, the highlighting for this one, but let's look at this other one. What is the chart capacity for 170 feet of boom at a 50 foot radius with the crawlers retracted? Okay, crawlers are retracted, so we're going to have this column here. Now we need to find 50 foot radius. Our capacity for 170 foot of boom at a 50 foot radius with the crawlers retracted is 96,200 pounds, which is a lot different than the capacity with the crawlers extended. All right, let's look at some examples using the 30 foot jib charts. What is the capacity for a 30 foot jib at a 15 degree offset and the jib is erected or attached to uh, 170 feet of main boom? The maximum working radius is 120 feet. So we got 170 feet of main boom, 120 foot radius, 30 foot jib, 15 degree offset. Find the correct jib chart, 30 foot jib, 170 foot main boom length. So we can ignore all this down here. Find the section for 15 degree offset. There, right there in the middle is 15 degree offset. So we can ignore all of this. If I can draw a straight squiggly line here to eliminate it. We can eliminate or X out, ignore the 25 and the 5 degree offset. This is the part of the chart we need. So now we need to find the row for 120 foot of radius. And there's 120 foot of radius. Follow it all the way over to where the radius value intersects with the capacity column. And our capacity is 32,000 pounds. Again, when we have a 30 foot jib, on 170 feet of main boom, the jib is set at a 15 degree offset, and her radius is 120 feet, 32,000 pounds is the maximum capacity. I know that seems like a lot to keep track of, but the yeah, more you practice, the more you do it, it's really not that big of a deal. Okay. Here's an example finding the capacity if we're using the 40 foot jib. What is the capacity for a 40 foot jib at a five degree offset erected on 110 feet of main boom with a maximum working radius of 50 feet? Find the right chart, and this is the right chart here, 40 foot of jib. Find the right main boom length that we're attached to, 110. So we can ignore this, ignore this, and ignore this we want to be right down here in this chart. Find the section for a five degree offset. So ignore everything that's not in the red. Everything that's not in the red is irrelevant. Find the row for a 50 foot radius. And there's 50 foot radius. Again, this is the column for radius here. 50 feet, and there's our capacity. 49,100 pounds and this there is an asterisk there that means that we are in the structural portion of the low chart if we try to lift more than 49,100 pounds with a 50 foot radius and all of these other configuration variables in place we're probably going to break something it could be maybe we pop a, a lacing maybe there's another structural component that fails when we uh, exceed this capacity. Exceeding the capacity is never okay, whether it's a crane or a forklift or a chain fall and a mom and pop uh, machine shop. Always stay within that capacity and you're going, you're going to be safe if you stay within that capacity. That's a, a good, of course assuming that everything else is being done correctly as well. Okay, some additional requirements. Uh, if the boom length, radius, or boom angles are between chart values, use the value that has the smallest capacity. 
For radius, you're almost always going to use the longer radius. For boom length, it's almost always going to be the longer boom length that you go with. But I'll show you some examples of what you need to do specifically uh, when you run into this situation. For boom angle, use the lowest boom angle if you're between values on a chart. Again, what you don't want to do is don't guess, don't interpolate, don't choose a capacity halfway between the two chart capacities. Always use a real number that's in the chart. Now on lattice booms, uh, lattice boom cranes, those are fixed booms. So you never have to worry about the boom length being between chart values. But for telescopic boom uh, cranes, there's pretty much, there's, there's an infinite possibility for the boom lengths, depending on how long, how far you extend the booms, how far in you retract the booms. So with telescopic boom cranes, boom length is more of an issue. Lattice boom cranes, you'll never be between values on a lattice boom as far as boom length. Now radius and boom angle uh, can be between values, but not boom length. Okay, here's an example. You have 140 feet of main boom. The radius is 51 feet. What is your chart capacity? Crawlers are retracted. Okay, find the column for charts re for crawlers retracted. Find the radius for 50 feet and the radius for 50, 55 feet. Again, uh, 51 is not in your chart. There's not a number for 51. So you choose the radius just below 51 feet and the next highest radius just above 51 feet. So that puts you at 50 and 55 feet. Again, look at the value for a 50 foot radius. It's 96,900. Look at the value for a 55 foot radius. It's 84,900. And you go with the smallest number every time. You, you compare the two values that are in the chart and go with the smallest number. That's what we do when we have a radius that is not found in the chart. Look at the one just below, the one just above, look at the capacity for each, then go with the smaller capacity. So in this situation with 141, 140 feet of main boom and a radius of 51 feet, our capacity is 84,900 pounds. If you're between boom angle, we have the same length of boom, 140 feet of main boom. Uh, crawlers are extended. Our boom angle is 55 degrees. There is not, again, this is the column for boom angle. Boom angle is 55 degrees. There's not a number in the chart for 55 degrees. So you look at the next highest, which would be 56.1 degrees, and the next lowest that is in the chart, 53.5 degrees. You compare the capacities and go with the smallest capacity. You look at the value for 56.1 degrees, which is 53,300. Look at the capacity for 53.5 degrees, which is 49,000, and the lowest is your capacity for that lift. All right, well, then, you know, that's a quick introduction to low charts. Uh, let me just summarize a few things. Uh, this is just one chart for one crane. Every crane is going to have slightly different charts. For some crane manufacturers, the charts look a lot different than the ones I've just shown you. The ones that I'm showing you to illustrate this are probably the, the simpler charts that are out there, the st most straightforward, easiest to understand, easiest to read. Uh, but it's within your ability to read any load chart for any crane. Uh, you guys can all do that. It just may take some time studying and maybe having someone help explain to you what, what you're looking at. But uh, uh, any of us can do it. And each crane has a different load chart, which I've mentioned. Different Manitowocs have different load charts. The Manitowoc 31000, its chart is completely different from the Manitowoc 888 that we've been looking at. Some charts look completely different than what we've just seen. 
Uh, as a safety manager, you may be involved in, in planning critical lifts. You'll need to become familiar with the chart. Uh, another point, reading the chart will provide you with what we call gross capacity. There are some other variables that need to be considered, as we'll see uh, when we talk about calculating the net capacity of a crane. But understanding the chart, having the chart capacity is a first step for planning a lift. Additional calculations are required, which we're going to get into. There will be a copy of this load chart available on Blackboard under assignments. You're going to need these charts to do some of the, the homework exercises, or the practice problem exercises that I'm going to provide. So if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I know it seems overwhelming, but you guys can do it.